seven, seven, first 17 verses of the book of 2 James. Uh, I think a lot of this is familiar and a lot of it uh, we need to think about a great deal. And I'm sure Eric will have something to say about it when I'm finished. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special, special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there, or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? <coughs> are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture of love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the, law, the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who, for he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do not commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but there's nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Here into the reading of our scripture. So as we continue in our walk through James, this week we are reminded of our calling to love our neighbors. Now, of course, this is not just what James is calling us to do, but it is indeed the second greatest commandment according to Jesus. When asked by the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 22 what the greatest commandment is, Jesus responds, We are to love God with all our hearts, all our mind, and all our soul. The second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Now James calls us to action and to remind us that we are to love our neighbors. In this scripture, he paints the picture of what people will do when they have a rich guest come and a poor guest come to be with them. The rich guest is given the seat of honor at the table or in, in the meeting and the poor guest is offered a stool or hey, maybe why don't you just go ahead and sit on the floor over there? Yeah, that would be better. I don't really want your dirty clothes messing up my nice chair. And James reminds us that this sort of treatment of anyone is a problem. You see, when we show favoritism, we are setting ourselves up to have an issue. It is not just that we might treat someone better than another person. It's that we are really allowing ourselves to become prejudiced against that other person. I am always astonished by how the parables in the Bible seem to line up with what we see in our world today. Because do we not still do this ourselves as a people? As a society, we have come to believe that being rich 
is the goal for all things in this world. That acquire, acquiring wealth is the only thing that we should be doing with our time. We've taken this idea so far that many people simply become famous because they are rich. I think about people like Jeff Bezos, the owner of Amazon, or Elon Musk, they come to mind today. Um, in days gone by, you think of the Vanderbelts or the Rockefellers, people of that ilk. And while I do not dislike those people because they are wealthy, I have to question where our priorities are and how they have shifted as a society when we view that as having a successful life. Simply collecting wealth is not the end all be all of our lives. At least it shouldn't be. We that have accepted Christ know that there is much more to this world and how we should be living our lives. Now James also warns us against prejudice against the poor. And this to me is even is an even greater problem today than the idolizing of the rich. You see, we have allowed ourselves as a society to look down upon those that are living in poverty. How many times have you heard someone say, well, if they don't want to be poor, they just need to get to work. Those people on welfare are just lazy. And they have it so good. You know, the government is not your baby daddy, right? Stop having kids because we're tired of paying for them. Brothers and sisters, I must ask you, where is the love of Christ in any of those statements? Poverty is an issue that is much more complicated than just someone uh, with someone's lack of a work ethic. What do you say to the single mother that is working two jobs at minimum wage to provide for her children? Hey, sorry your husband died. Or sorry your husband ran out on you and the kids, but you really should have thought of that before you had him. What do you say to someone that is disabled? Hey, I know you were in a terrible accident, but you should have thought of that before you were driving to work that day. You know it's a dangerous road. Or I'm sorry you were born with that disability, but you should still be working and pulling your own weight. What do you say to the veteran that is struggling with physical and mental health issues? Hey, thanks for your service. But now that you are home, you need to get over what you saw over there and get back to work. And what do you say to the elderly person who is doing their best to survive, but finds the things that they have saved have dwindled down to almost nothing? You should have just gone ahead and died 10 years ago. Do you really believe that Jesus would look upon those people that are struggling and say to them, go get a job, you bum? Well, if you do, then I think you and I must be reading different scriptures. Because what does Jesus have to say about the poor? In Luke chapter 6, verse 20 to 21, Blessed are the poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you will be filled. In Luke chapter 14, he tells us of having a banquet. And he tells a man to invite those that are poor in order to feed them instead of those that are rich. And he tells that man by taking care of those in need, he will be repaid at the resurrection because of his righteousness. In Matthew chapter 25, he tells us that we will inherit the kingdom when we feed the hungry, give the thirsty something to drink, clothe the naked, and take care of the sick. You see, we are called by our Redeemer to help those that are in need, and we are to be doing what we can to offer them a hand up, not putting our foot on them to keep them down. Now at this point you may be thinking to yourself, Pastor, how can you possibly be so naive? How can you advocate for helping those people? Don't you know that there are so many of them that will abuse this system? Don't you know that there are so many of them that are conning us 
just so they can get ahead without doing any work. Well, no, I am not naive. At least in this instance, I'd like to believe. I do know that those people exist. I do know that there are people that will abuse the system. However, I care more about helping those in need than I do about those who might abuse the system, and I will tell you why. You see, it has to do with us not being a yeah, but person. You see, a yeah, but person does this. When someone calls to help someone out, they say, yeah, but. Yeah, but pastor, if we give them help, they will just keep coming back. Yeah, but pastor, if we give them money, they will just use it on drugs and alcohol. Yeah, but pastor, they need to show us that they're going to work towards getting out of poverty before we can help them. Please tell me how Christ has shown us that we are to be a people that say, yeah, but. What if Christ had said, yeah, but. What if he had said, yeah, but they are going to keep sinning. Why should I die for their salvation? Yeah, but they will continue to fight with one another after I have shown them how to live. Why should I even bother? You see, we are not a yeah, but people, and Christ was not a yeah, but Messiah. Our responsibility for that money or the help in whatever form we offer it to others is done when it is offered. What do I mean by that? If I give someone money, my responsibility for that money is done the moment I give it to them. It is no longer on me to decide how they spend it. God does not say to us, give to them and then make sure it's used in the way that you think it should be used. He simply calls us to give and he simply calls us to help. If that person turns around and spends it on drugs, well, that is between them and God. As we learned last week, we are to leave room for God's judgment in all things. You see, that is why I am not worried about those that abuse the system. They will answer for what they do. Now, I want to discuss another idea here. And it is an idea that we hear often repeated. God helps those who help themselves. How many times have you heard that one in your life? Probably a lot. Do you believe that that is from the Bible? Well, I've heard it a million times, and for the longest time, I did believe that it was Scripture as well. It is not Scripture. It comes from Poor Richard's Almanac, the almanac that was written by Ben Franklin. And we've adopted this saying to mean, the only way that God will help you is if you're willing to help yourself. But that is not what it means. It means that if you are working hard and doing the things that God finds favorable, he will be there with you. It does not mean you are poor because you are lazy. If God was only willing to help us when we help ourselves, then I ask you, why was Jesus sent to die for us when we did nothing to deserve him? Finally, today, I like to address this idea about the poor that I've heard, and it is this. The government should not be involved in helping them at all. It should be the church who does this. Well, I would love for this to be the case, brothers and sisters. Because if it is, then I ask you when and where. When do you want to get started and where do you want to begin? You see, James reminds us today that if we have faith but no deeds are faith is a dead faith. If we are proclaiming the message of Jesus Christ with our lips, but not living it out with our actions, our faith is not very strong. You see, we know that we are indeed saved by our faith, but it is our actions that show others our commitment to that faith. And it is our actions that show God our thankfulness for his Son. And it is our actions that show our Savior, Jesus Christ, that we love him and all that he has done for us. Now, John Wesley would have called this sanctifying grace. It is the part of spiritual growth as followers of Christ for us to do good works in his name. He would have indeed pushed us towards a faith 
in action and not just a faith in words. So if you find yourself in need today, or if you know someone that is in need today, please do not hesitate to contact us and ask for help. We would love to help you in the name of Jesus Christ. My challenge for you this week is this. What is one thing you can do to help others this week? Do so in the name of Jesus Christ. Don't just talk about it. Go out and do it. Amen.